Okay, good morning, guys. Um, today we're going to start the last unit of the year on evolution. Um, today I just want to give you kind of a basic intro to what the theory of evolution is and um, some talk about uh, Charles Darwin. Okay, so I want you guys, I don't really have time to talk much about this, but I want you guys to just think about this. Did the ancient Romans really exist? If so, what evidence is there? Um, and does that evidence make it a fact? So if you think about it, we have buildings, we have books, we have writings, we have we can dig up graves. We have a lot of evidence that shows that they existed. Now, does that evidence that we can find 2,000 years later actually make it a fact that they were alive? I just want you guys to just think about that for a couple minutes. Okay, so evolution is the process in which modern organisms have descended from ancient organisms. Now, I know a lot of you guys have seen that picture at the bottom, which shows a a monkey or a chimpanzee kind of turning into a human. I'm going to state this right now, just get it out of the way. No scientist will ever tell you humans evolved from monkeys. That's not what it says, and I know a lot of you guys think that because you guys see this picture and that's what you think. Humans and monkeys or humans and chimpanzees shared a common ancestor millions of years ago. Humans did not evolve from chimpanzees. Okay, so let's just get that straight out there right now. That's a big misconception that everybody thinks because they don't understand how evolution works. Okay, so that is totally incorrect. Okay, I'm going to read a couple quotes here. This is a guy named Richard Dawkins. He's one of the leading scientists of the day right now. Um, evolution is a fact. Beyond reasonable doubt, beyond serious doubt, beyond sane, informed, intelligent doubt, beyond doubt, evolution is a fact. The evidence for evolution is at least as strong as the evidence for the Holocaust even allowing for eyewitnesses to the Holocaust. Think about that one for a second. It is the plain truth that we are cousins of chimpanzees, somewhat more distant cousins of monkeys, more distant cousins still of aardvarks and manatees, yet more distant cousins of bananas and turnips. Continued list as long as desired. Basically, Richard Dawkins is saying the evidence for evolution is at least as strong as the evidence for basically anything you guys take for granted in your everyday life. And he's referencing the tree of life idea that you are related to every living organism on this earth, including bacteria. Okay, so what do we mean when we speak of the theory of evolution? One of the biggest things I always hear from students every year is, oh, that's just a theory. That's just a theory. I'm not going to believe that. I, who cares? That's just a theory. The word theory in science means a lot. Okay, in everyday life, people use the word theory to mean a hunch, a guess. But in science, a theory is the top of the line. It's as high as it goes. Okay, so it's a hypothesis that's been confirmed over and over and over and over again by many different observations and experiments, and it is essentially accepted by the scientific community as accounting for a lot of known facts. Okay, so let me just read another quote here. You guys don't need to write this down. The term proof is used in mathematics and, and courts of law, but does not belong in science because it implies absolute certainty. Scientists gather evidence which might help support or refute hypotheses and theories, but these ideas can never be absolutely proven, even when supported by many different lines of evidence. So in science, there are no facts. Theory is as the is the highest thing there is in science. Okay, so let me list some other theories you guys take for granted. The heliocentric theory of the solar system states that the um, sun is at the center of the solar system. I, I bet if I pulled every person in school, 100% of all people would say, that, yeah, the sun is at the center of the solar system. But guess what? That is a theory. That's a theory. We don't call that a fact. How about this one? Theory of gravity. Again, if I pulled everyone to school, everyone would say, yeah, gravity exists. But guess what? That's a theory. Okay, so evidence or so evolution could be better said to be a theorem, a theorem, which um, is accepted, is an accepted idea that accounts for a lot of known facts. Okay, again, a couple more quotes I want to read here. Um, this one's from a famous uh, scientist. He's long dead now, but he said, We may have all come into existence five minutes ago, provided with ready-made memories with holes in our socks and hair that need cutting. Okay, given the evidence now available, for evolution to be anything other than a fact would require a similar confidence trick by some creator. So basically Dawkins and Bertrand Russell are saying that given what we have, the evidence we have for evolution – Evolution is essentially a fact, and there are no facts, it is a theory, but ev evolution is true unless there is some kind of creator, some god, if you will, that's playing a trick on us. Okay, 
So for the rest of this chapter, I want you guys to think of yourself like a detective. So we are like detectives who have come on the scene after a crime has been committed. The murderer's actions have vanished into the past. The detective has no hope of witnessing the actual crime with his own eyes. With the what the detective does have is traces that remain, and there's a great deal of trust there. There are footprints, fingerprints, including DNA fingerprints, bloodstains, letters, and diaries. So basically, we're coming onto the scene after a lot of this uh, evolutionary past has happened. We can't see it happening because it happened millions or billions of years ago, but we have lots and lots of evidence like a detective does. Okay, so the aids of inference that lead scientists to the fact of evolution are far more numerous, more convincing, more incontrovertible than any eyewitness reports have ever been used in any court of law in any century to establish guilt in any crime. I'd like you guys, if you have time, watch that little video right there. It's only a minute long. It's a really cool video on something called selective observation. Okay, so now let's get into the meat of it. So in the 1830s, a scientist who would become one of if not the most famous scientist of all time, along the lines with uh, Isaac Newton and uh, Einstein, Charles Darwin set sail on a ship from England called the HMS Beagle for a voyage around the world. Darwin is a naturalist. He likes to study nature and plants and animals. He just is obsessed with collecting animals, taking lots of um, notes. He's traveling around the entire world. This is like a five-year journey. As he's doing this, they keep stopping a whole bunch of exotic places that Basically, a whole bunch of people, most people have never been ever in human history. And he collects a lot of plant animal specimens, specimens and he uh, actually takes them on the ship and brings them back to England. Okay, so he studies these specimens. He's reading the latest scientific books, which I'll talk about later in this chapter. And he's just taking a whole bunch of notes and observations um, throughout this journey. Now, again, this is a five-year journey. He's basically trapped on this boat or on these really exotic places for five years. So he's got a lot of time to just think and observe. Okay, so during his travels, Darwin made numerous observations and collected evidence that led him to propose a new hypothesis about the way life changes over time. Okay, so his idea, which we'll talk about later, is called natural selection. But his hypothesis, which is now supported by a huge, huge, huge body of evidence, we'll get into the piece of evidence at the end of the chapter, we now call the theory of evolution. Again, there's a little video there that kind of talks about Darwin, if you guys have time to watch it. Okay, so Darwin observed that many plants and animals were well suited to the environments they, they inhabited. Okay, so he was also impressed by the ways in which organisms survived and reproduced and made their offspring. So he wondered, is there some kind of process that's responsible for leading to such varieties of lifestyles? For example, why are the animals that live in South America and Australia so different? Like, why are there marsupials in Australia, but essentially no marsupials in North America? There are possums, but that's it. Okay, so Darwin was puzzled by where different species lived and did not live. So grasslands are found in basically every continent except for Antarctica, obviously. Um, grasslands in some regions were similar to one another, but were inhabited by very different animals. For example, when he stopped in Australia, he noted there are no rabbits here. Even though rabbits are all over Europe and Asia and North America and South America, and Australia has the same types of habitats, why are there no rabbits in Australia? Now, you guys probably know the answer to this from ninth grade. If you think back, the answer comes from plate tectonics. A guy named Alfred Wegener came up with the idea of plate tectonics and um, tectonic shifts. Um, he, this idea was just very brand new. It was coming out. It actually wasn't fully out yet. I think Wegener did that in the early 1900s. And this is 1830s. So people didn't understand this idea yet. But Australia splits off from Pangaea very early. So the animals that live on Australia are... Very, very different from the other major continents. <clears throat> okay, Darwin was not only collecting living things, he was also collecting a bunch of fossils. Now, some of these fossils resembled organisms that were still alive today. Some of them were unlike any creature they'd ever seen. If you look in the bottom left, you'll see these giant armadillo-looking things. These things are massive, though. They're like three feet tall. And in the bottom right, you see that thing right there? That's actually a giant ground sloth. These things lived all over North and South America. These things were like 10 feet tall. So think of a normal sloth that you guys think of. This is a gigantic tree sloth. <clears throat> okay, the most famous place Darwin stopped was the Galapagos Islands, which is right on the equator off the coast of Ecuador down South America. <clears throat> so Darwin noticed that the Galapagos Islands were very close to each other, like within 50 or so miles of each other, but they had vastly different climates. 
So Darwin noted the different types of organisms that lived on each island, and he noticed that they had different traits. Some of the organisms we're going to talk about are these tortoises. If you notice, there's two major types of tortoises. There's the dome back tortoise, which is the one on the bottom left. You can see it kind of has a uh, curved shell. And then there's the saddleback tortoise, which has this thing. It looks like the uh, a saddle, like someone would sit on. Now, I want you to think about it. What would be the advantage of having the saddleback shell as opposed to the dome back shell? What can this turtle with the, the, the saddleback shell do that the dome back one cannot? And the answer, which Darwin eventually figures out, is it can reach its neck up higher. Think about it. It can get its neck here and reach up to food, which is higher up in the, the shrubbery than the one on the left. Okay, so the one on the right developed on islands that had um, shrubs that were higher up from the ground, and the turtle on the left, tortoise on the left, sorry, developed on islands that had um, shrubbery that was lower to the ground. So Darwin wondered if animals living on different islands had once been members of the same species. Another animal that Darwin spent a lot of time studying were the finches. There's like 16 or 17 different species of finch, finches on the different Galapagos Islands. Darwin believed that they all started off as one single type of finch that traveled over to the Galapagos Islands from South America. And once they spread to the different islands, they slowly evolved into different species of finch. And the answer is because they lived on different islands with different climates and particularly different food sources. We're going to come back to these ideas of the finches and the tortoises later on throughout this unit. At this point, I just want you guys to stop and do the, la the three review questions for section one.